Hello and welcome. My name is Melissa Galasso and I am very excited to be here with you today to talk about the two ASUs that FASB closed out 2022 with. Uh, both were issued in December 2022. Both were relatively small standards. And so when we take a look at these types of standards, um, one addressing transition, the other one addressing effective dates, uh, not a whole lot uh, of uh, change so much as really what is needed to be able to implement. And uh, I think that's really Really important as we look at both of these standards. So ASU 202205 and ASU 202206, the last two ASUs of the year. Um, not the smallest number of ASUs issued uh, in a year, I believe, but definitely on the smaller end. Uh, you know, usually we get to uh, last year we had 10 issued, uh, and this year they were all relatively small uh, as we look at them. So uh, there was a handful of uh, standards that were really just trying to get us where we needed to go. A really, I think, a result of a lot of what happened during. COVID, where we prioritize certain items and you kind of just working through the rest of them at this point. Uh, so this is going to be a two for one special. We are going to hit on both of these ASUs in one nano learning. So we're going to hit on 2022-05 and then ASU 2022-06. So let's start with the chronologically uh, cr uh, first one, I guess we should say here, which is ASU 2022-05. Uh, and this is a very specific um, ASU, and it really addresses something that has been delayed multiple times, uh, which is going to be related to our financial um, or to our financial services and in particular insurance. Uh, this is really related to an ASU that came out in 2018, but again, it has been delayed multiple times. Uh, and ASU 2018-12 is related to targeted improvements for accounting for long duration contracts. Now, that's very important. Uh, previously, prior to ASU 2018-12, FASB updated short duration contracts, things like, um, you know, health insurance, uh, car insurance, things that last, you know, typically under a year. When we're talking about long duration contracts, we're typically talking about things like life insurance, right? So very long duration uh, that you're going to have these. Hopefully we all live very long and healthy lives as we look at this. And the goal of ASU 2018-12 was to provide a better understanding of the accounting for insurance. Because if you ever worked in the insurance field, you would know that it is a very, um, nuanced field. Uh, it has a lot of things that you would not experience ordinarily, but uh, obviously when you're dealing with these things like estimates and the, you know, you know, insurance, some people say is a bet, right? You're betting that something's going to happen and the insurance companies betting that it's not or that the premiums that they're charging offset that, right? Uh, and so there's very, very specialized accounting in this area. And when they updated ASU 2018-12, um, they made some changes around primarily those disclosures that are being provided related to this, but they also made changes in the area of consistency, trying to um, have a less um, less differences, less diversity in practice as we go through. And so they sort of standardized and made things a little bit easier. Um, it's not easier though to implement, hence the multiple delays as we go through, uh, one related to COVID, one uh, just a, a, a normal delay as we go through. And so uh, as people have started to look closer and closer at this, uh, there were some questions that were raised about how the standard was being implemented. So ASU 2018-12 requires the insurance entity to apply a retrospective transition method um, as of the period of the earliest, um, as of earliest period presented or the beginning of the fiscal year if, um, you know, that is being elected, if it's elected early. Uh, and so that feedback that was received is that when you're applying this long duration changes um, in this scenario, you might, especially for publicly traded companies who have to show multiple years, right? So they don't have to uh, just show two, they actually show three uh, income statements. And so as a result, there would could be potentially during this retrospective application, contracts that were de-recognized because of a sale or disposal of an individual or group of contracts before the effective date, and then we would have to actually go back in and redo them. And so as a result, you might end up with a gain that gets reversed uh, as a result of this. And so people said, is this really the best use of our time? Is this really how we want to uh, go through and address this? And so the feedback that was received was that this was just 
not going to be decision useful information, right? So when we think about the application of this, um, it could be that you had gains or losses um, that have changed because of the adoption of a new standard. And again, that would be confusing uh, to people as they go through this. Uh, and so a lot of what the feedback that was received was that there was just a lot of operability challenges. And so uh, when we think about the investors, what do they want as we go forward? And so as a result, ASU 2022-05 would allow an insurance entity to make an accounting policy election. So again, this is not a mandate, it's an option. And it would be on a transaction by transaction basis to exclude contracts from applying ASU 2018-12 when they have already been derecognized because of a sale or disposal, again, of either an individual or group of contracts or legal entities, so long as it happens prior to the long duration contract effective date. So before ASU 2018-12, uh, in that scenario. And so long as, again, the entity has no significant continuing involvement with the derecognized contracts. And so that was something that they added after the exposure draft, which is, again, that you're, um, if they've been disposed of or sold, that you're no longer going to be um, can have a significant continuing involvement in it. And so uh, as a result, people felt like this would be um, a little bit easier for, in terms of the implementation, provide more decision useful information for the user. And so in terms of, again, when we look at this, this is simply a transition change. We're allowing people to exclude certain items in transition. Uh, and so it is the same as the effective dates are in ASU 2011. You're probably saying, why aren't they the same as 2018-12? Well, as I said, this was delayed multiple times. Uh, and so the most recent is ASU 2011. And so this is for public entities uh, that are not um, going to be uh, smaller reporting companies. They are going to do this for fiscal years beginning after December 15th of 2022, which would be our 2023 year end. So uh, as we get into the upcoming quarter, that would be really important for these public companies. And then for everyone else, there is a two year delay in this. And so as you look um, between public and private, instead of having a one year delay, they've given a two year delay. So this would be 2025 for those entities who are either small reporting companies or, um, or privately held organizations. However, again, early adoption is permitted uh, as we look at this. So not a lot of supply, uh, surprise there. All right, as we continue on, we're gonna move on to ASU 2022-06. And ASU 2022-06 is simply a change in the effective date of a standard. And this really goes back to just timing. So when we look at ASU 2020-04, right, which was the last ASU that was issued prior to COVID, this was issued in early March prior to COVID being really a household term, uh, they implemented reference rate reform. And so this dates all the way back to 2012. Uh, the, uh, we learned that LIBOR, which is a hypothetical rate, it's a rate that banks said they would charge other banks and in interbank lending. But what we know there's not much interbank lending. Uh, and so these were hypothetical rates set by a panel of banks. Well, in 2014, we learned that there was major collusion between the uh, standards, uh, the rate setters for the bank and their investment bankers from the same bank. And so in 2014, the Financial Conduct uh, Authority said, you know what, we are not going down this path that we are uh, going to make this, uh, you know, we're not going to, um, as we think about this, make it more complicated uh, than it has to be. Uh, and so we're going to make this transition a little bit easier because if you had a hedge tied to LIBOR, you might have to de-designate that hedge as a result of LIBOR going away. Um, when we look at um, leases, right, 840 and 842 have you know, these remeasurement triggers that would happen. Um, when we look at other um, you know, types of instruments like mortgages and loans that are tied to LIBOR, if you change a reference rate, right, that is a considerable amount of work uh, that requires that the entity go through and do quite a bit uh, in that area. And so um, the ASU that was issued in 2020-04 said, okay, we're gonna give you transition guidance. We're gonna give you these practical expedients. We're gonna give you these alternatives that we're gonna allow just for a period of time, right? As you transition out of LIBOR and into say a SOFA or say into another uh, reference rate, we're gonna give you this nice transition guidance. Well, when they issued that, um, ASU 2020-04 included a sunset effective date. So basically, when they issued this back in March of 2020, LIBOR was supposed to go away in December of 2021. 
However, again, no one was predicting a global pandemic. And so as a result um, of this global pandemic, we have not gotten rid of LIBOR. LIBOR has continued uh, well into 2023. We expect it to be around up until about June of 2023. Uh, and so as a result, the effective date actually expired in 2022, one year after LIBOR was supposed to go away. And so all this standard does is push back that sunset provision. So instead of having a 2022 sunset, it is now going to have a December 31st of 2024 sunset. Uh, and so again, that is one year typically after we expect LIBOR to go away here in the United States. Uh, and so again, we want to give su uh, sufficient time for people to take the modifications uh, and do what they need to do to get away from LIBOR and into these alternative reference rates. Now that we've kind of have the opportunity to do so, we're not really dealing so much with COVID. And so uh, this standard, because it is just a change in the effective date, it was effective upon issuance, just giving us more time to implement. So again, two standards, one addressing transition and one addressing effective date, uh, really just trying to close the year up, uh, making sure that we are able to really do what we need to do in terms of financial reporting. All right. Well, we closed out 2022 uh, with two relatively niche standards, two relatively small standards, but really important, uh, allowing better transition and better effective dates. So I want to wish you all a wonderful end to 2022 and a very happy 2023. Thank you guys so much for joining me. And I hope to see you on a future nano learning. Have a great day, guys. Bye bye.